Hello everyone, you're joining me on a little short session, quick hit and run trip down to this place. This is Willow Park in Aldershot, Hampshire. Great place for coming out and trying to catch a few fish through the course of the winter months, summer as well of course, but uh, it's pretty cold and it's pretty grim and it's very wet at the moment. But the whole point of me coming here today is just to have a quick chat with you about some of the very basic things that sometimes we overlook. You know, in this modern day of carp fishing, the end, the very end is often the thing that concentrates people's thoughts a lot more, that last 25%. Which super rig should we use? What uber tactic should we use? But one of the main things you've got to do is you've got to get the basics right in the first instance. And if you do that, that will definitely help you catch more fish. So, what are my five top tips for getting it right, right from the beginning? Now I'm going to start with a really, really, really basic one, and that is your rod choice. A lot of the time we can only afford to buy one set of rods. And remember, fishing rods are a little bit like golf clubs, you know, there are certain rods that will do certain things in certain situations. So before you even buy a fishing rod, the first thing you've got to do is think, what sort of fishing are you doing? If you primarily PVA bag fish, use one that's good for PVA bag fishing. If you're a long distance angler on a long distance water, then obviously you need something that's gonna get out a long way. And if you're fishing short range, you can afford to compromise on the test curve and taper of that rod to have something that will give you more fun when you're playing those fish. Now there's a couple of words that I've already said there, which are test curve and taper, that you might not necessarily know what they mean. So let's look at test curve first, because that's the benchmark that most people judge for their rods. And they think the bigger the test curve, the bigger the rod, the further you're gonna be able to cast. That's technically not true. Test curve is actually the amount of force that it takes to get the rod from straight to a 90 degree bend, simple as that. So a two pound test curve rod, two pound of pressure will do that. Three pound test curve rod, three pound will do that, etc., etc., etc. Now, we also hear the word backbone said. And backbone means the strength through the course of the rod itself, all the way from the butt through to the tip but that relates to something called taper. Now a fast taper rod is one that doesn't bend a lot and it recovers very, very quickly. Fast taper rods are great for long distance fishing. You need a heavy lead and you need a bit of muscle and bulk to be able to compress them to whack them out a long way. Through action rods bend all the way through, almost right the way down to the handle. Not that far, obviously, because you've got a bit more backbone going through the bottom section. But basically, they will bend a lot more through the course of the rod. And they're beautiful for playing fish on, but actually, if you want to go a long way, they're not really as good as a faster taper rod. So just go back to what we said right at the very beginning. What sort of fishing do you do? If you're chucking PVA bags, 80 to 100 yards, which is what a lot of people do a lot of the time, then something like a three pound test curve, middle of the road, not too fast, not too through action rod, that will suit you perfectly. If you want to chuck single baits a long, long way, then three and a half pound test curve, fast taper rods, that's the thing for the job. And like, take me here today, I'm fishing at Willow Park, I'm in a small bay, and I'm only going over to that far margin over there, just under the snags. So this is an interesting one. I don't need something that will cast a long way, but I do need something that will cope with a PVA bag. I also need something that's got a bit of backbone to be able to get out if there's a fish that tries and take me into those snags over there. So I'm using a three pound test curve, medium to fast taper rod. It's the EOS range, really, really cheap rods as well. Lovely action on them for playing fish, but enough stiffness through the butt to pull fish out if you need to. Now there's one last point that I will say about fishing rods, and this is when you're going out to long range. See if that rod fits you. Now that might sound really silly because you're going to look at it and go, you know what, it's a fishing rod, it's not a pair of trousers. And I get that, but your arm is a different length to my arm. We might be the same size, but some people have got longer arms than others. And if you want the perfect fit on a fishing rod, hold it as you would normally hold it, with the real seat between whichever finger that you have it, which should normally be the second or the third. So hold it there and then get the handle and find it where it comes to underneath your armpit because you should have about an inch between the end of the butt of the rod and the base of your armpit. If it's like that, it fits perfectly. If it's too long and it's going out the, the side or it sticks into you, the handle's too long for you, you won't be able to cast it properly. And if it's the other way around, it's too short, you won't get the leverage. So just check that rod fits you first because some rods have different handle lengths than others. Right, let's have a look at reels now, and there's a number of things that you can think about when it comes to choosing the perfect reel for your fishing situation. 
And the first one is, what is your fishing situation? Because if you need to cast a long way, you need a big reel. And if you don't need to cast a long way, you know what? You don't need a big reel. But once again, there are situations where we might want to do a little bit of the both. So, point one, reels come in different sizes and they come in thousands. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated. The reels that I've got out there now, they're probably the smaller size that you would use for carp fishing. There are 10,000 free spool and they're lovely for the sort of fishing that I'm doing now, not long range. We've then got a 9,000, an 11,000, and a 13,000 in the FX. Now these are great reels. Strangely, the 9,000 has actually got a bigger spool than this 10,000. So just bear that in mind when you're having a look at it. But generally, the bigger the number, the bigger the spool capacity. The bigger the spool capacity, the more line you can put on, and also the further you can cast. So if you are going out and out long range, then something like the FX13 would be absolutely brilliant. The 11 suits most angling situations and the nine well that's lovely for going up to about 100 yards but it's also really good for fishing in the edge if you want to do that too right we're going to look at leads now and lead choices which includes both sizes and shapes but primarily shape because just like golf clubs there are lots of different leads that do lots of different things so let's have a look at the very basics first Inline does exactly what it says on the tin. That's an inline, basically line goes through the middle of it. And these are brilliant for things like PVA bags and also fishing on hard surfaces. So if you've got nice, decent flat gravel in front of you, compacted sand, something like that, one of those down on top of it, absolutely fantastic. This one is a horizon. And as the name suggests, you can cast it an awful long way. The shape is brilliant. And if you want to cast out to the horizon, this is the tool for the job. This is a personal favourite of mine, this is called a tri-bomb. Nice and dumpy, a lot of weight comes into effect very, very quickly and helps hook those fish. So, it doesn't roll around. If you look at the ones that have got flat sides, they're great for fishing where you've got a bit of undulation on the bottom. And then we've got this one. This is a brilliant one for if you're fishing on bars or alternatively if you're fishing in flowing water. It's flat, it's called a cling-on for obvious reasons, it just grips down onto the bottom, nipples there along both the top and bottom of the lead to hold it in place. And that's brilliant if you want your lead to sit in place and not move in any way, shape or form. Grapplers, personal favourite of mine, cast this out into the lake, drag it back and the little tines on the outside of that will pull back any weed or debris and that will show you exactly what's on the deck to help you decide what rig you should use or what presentation is best for your fishing situation. And then finally, I've always got a few of these around and they're not used as much as they used to be now, but brilliant for getting the line down under the water and out the way of danger. If there's boats, if there's weed, if there's birds, anything like that. And also pressurized fish don't like them. These are back leads. Simply clip them on the line, slide them down, they'll get that line out of the way. And believe me, if your fish are pressurized, these can definitely help you catch more carp. If you're new to carp fishing and look across the shelves of a tackle shop, you will see a multitude of hook link materials. There is so much choice, it is incredible. And of course, all of these things do a certain job and they do it well. But the key is knowing which one to use at which stage. And I'll start off with good old straightforward supple braid. This is one of my favourites. This is Reflex Camo. Now, it comes in various different braking strains, 15, 20 and 25 pound. And this is, exactly as it says, a braided soft material. It's ideal for PVA bags because you can tuck it into the bag really well, fish it nice and short, and it will sit lovely and flat on the deck. We've now got the coated braids. And this is a particular favorite of mine. This is Camatex Semi Stiff. Once again, comes in different braking strains, 15, 20 and 25. Obviously, the thicker the braking strain, generally the thicker the material as well. But literally, this is a braid with a plastic coating on the outside of it. It's got our camo text on it, so it's disrupted pattern, so it's virtually invisible on the bottom of the lake too. And these are really nice when you want something that's a little bit stiffer than straight braid. And I tend to use Camatex Semi-Stiff an awful lot as a boom, which is a semi-supple boom for things like multi-rigs or alternatively reverse combis. I still want a little bit of movement in that rig as well. Just remember physics here, guys, as well. Gravity against force. If the hook bait is really, really heavy, it's gonna drop straight down. So you want a supple link. If you want it to kick away, 
you need a lighter bait, balance that thing off, balance that hook bait off, critically balance pop-up or a wafter and use a stiff bait and that will kick it away. Loads and loads of different hook patterns out there and they suit different types of rigs. So firstly think about the rig that you want to achieve and then use the right hook for the job because if you use the wrong one or you tie it incorrectly, it will act against you rather than for you. So let's have a look at in-turned and out-turned eyes first and foremost. Anything with an out-turned eye is great for a choddy, for a multi-rig or alternatively for a zig rig. And they sit really nice and give a lovely aggressive turn, particularly with a multi and also the choddy. Interned eyes are absolutely brilliant, really, really simple. Not less not, you've got your line liner already there, and they're great for PVA bag rigs, straight on the deck, no fuss, dead, dead simple. Now, if you're not sure which rig to tie, or alternatively how to tie it, then why not get hold of one of our ready tied rigs? Because they're tied perfectly for the exact situation that they're meant. So PVA bag rigs, chod rigs, etc., etc. You can buy the materials as well, and then you've got something to copy. It gives you a perfect example of what the rig should look like, and then you've got the bits to make it yourself. And I remember, oh, speaking of which, come on, that's the one that was down on that corner, right? It wants to go, it's still going. And we were talking earlier about test curve of rods. And these are such nice rods to play fish on, but they have got that stiff backbone that I was talking about, that what I want this fish to do now is come out from that corner. I've got to keep the rod low because there's a rope down there and it wants to go under and around the rope. But yeah, happy days, that's a bite. We're back out from under that rope now. Or are we? That ball's bouncing. I don't think there's anything underwater on it. It's a good old boy, isn't it? Absolute rattler. And you know, you never know what they're going to be in the winter. Sometimes you'll just get the lightest indication on the bobbin where there's. Oh, oh God, I thought it'd come off then. <laughs> uh, yeah, you get the lightest indication on the bobbin where it's just a lift or a drop. And then sometimes you get an absolute rattle like that one and there was no mistake in that. Coming out this way now, I can get up in the air and you can just see the curve of that test curve now. Got him, happy days. Steady on. Cracking scrap on it, and he's a mid double. Winter common. I was going to say it's cold water, but it's not really that cold yet, is it? Conditions are so mild at the moment. Although by the time you see this, it might be really, really cold. All I can say is whatever, just get out there and get fishing because there's always a chance. 